Amen. A few years ago, we used to sing a song that was, went something like this, and I'm not going to sing it. But it says, uh, my heavenly home is bright and fair, and I feel like traveling on. We would sing that song, and we would really get excited about the anticipation of going home to be with the Lord. Amen. And I know you have that same expectation today. Nothing has changed for you. You still are looking forward to going home to be with Jesus. And so as we're praying in this service today, I want you to cast all your cares upon him. I want you to know that Jesus cares for you, that he knows where you are and what you have need of even before you ask. So the petition that you bring before him today, he's already aware of it. But sometimes by telling him what we have need of and our concerns, it releases us to give us the freedom to be able to come and lift up holy hands in this place and bless the Lord. So please pray with me. Lord Jesus, we know you are mighty in power, and we know you're going to accomplish a mighty work in this service. Thank you, Lord, for giving us the opportunity to come together to celebrate you, Lord, and what you're all about. We believe in you, Lord, for miracles and signs and wonders to follow. We believe in you, Lord, just to give us strength in the inner man, that that inner man can be victorious and walk in the newness of life. We believe in your Lord that you're going to speak to us that have assembled here in this place today. For Lord, you know the thoughts and the intents of our hearts. So we're giving everything over to you, Lord, and we're praying that your will and plan would unfold in each and every one of our lives. We realize that we can't do anything without you. Jesus, we need your strength and we need your presence, Lord, in this place. So Lord, come and minister to us, Lord and give us faith and confidence in the prayers that we're praying toward heaven today. Jesus, move in a mighty way. Touch that one, Lord, that needs a healing right now in Jesus' name. That one that may feel discouraged, Lord, lift him up and bless him in a special way. God, we're going to believe you. We're going to trust in you, for you are mighty in power, and there's no one like you, Lord. Work in your people today, Lord. Strengthen that inner man, Lord, and bless, and we give you praise and Thanks for it in the wonderful and mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Let's sing unto the Lord.
He spoke the word and this earth was created. He spoke the word and there was light. He spoke the word, hallelujah, and everything that in this world is, was. How we can rejoice in that word, amen? There's going to be a word of the Lord today, and there's still power in that word. And there is power in the name, the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, no other name that can save us, no other name that can redeem us, no other name that we could call upon at all times. Today, when I came into church a little earlier, Brother Dart was getting the baptistry ready. Someone is going to go down in the name of Jesus. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And I'd like to encourage, maybe there's someone here that has not yet been baptized in Jesus' name. And maybe today could be your opportunity to experience remission of sins is what the Bible calls it. All our sins are gone. They are forgiven. They are no more because we go down in the only saving name of Jesus. No other name but Jesus.
Jesus. Yeah, yeah, Hallelujah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. You may be seated. Again, it's a blessing to be here today to come and celebrate the Lord and what he means to me. Amen. He truly is the center of my life. Amen. 32 men got together yesterday downstairs and we had some wonderful food that was prepared by the ladies and ladies we want to say to all of you that had a part in making this breakfast a wonderful experience for us men. We thank you for that. We really do. And all the men clap their hands. Amen. Not only that, but we are blessed that our pastor reminded us of the responsibilities that we have as men. And he told us that it was important that we set priorities. Amen. That the number one thing should be Jesus and salvation. And thereafter, it's your family and then it's your association with others that are around you. If we can do those things, then we'll have a good life. We'll have a blessed life. Amen. Salvation has been made available to us. But sometimes we don't always accept it. You know, Jesus is always knocking on the door. But we have to allow him to come in in order for us to have a relationship with him. And it began simply by repenting and asking him to forgive you and making that turnaround. And thereafter, you are buried, as Brother Thibodeau has already said here, in the wonderful name of Jesus for the remission of your sins. Never to be remembered anymore, those sins that you committed. And then the Bible promises us that Jesus will fill us with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And we will speak in other tongues as the Spirit of God give the utterance. That's his plan. That's Jesus' plan for salvation. That is the message that Peter spoke on the day of Pentecost. And so I'm so glad I had an opportunity to experience that. I'm glad somebody came to me one day and they asked me the question. They, I know that you are a believer. Amen. There was something about my life that spoke to that individual. But he says, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believe? And that was the beginning of my eyes being open to the plan that the Lord has for the church and for us as individuals. So I'm so glad for somebody who came my way one day to tell me about what I needed to do to be saved. And so that's important. So, Brother Gerlich, we are so appreciative of our youth pastor and our youth. Amen. He needs to make an announcement. Amen. Praise the Lord, everybody. I uh, just want to uh, give honor where honor is due. Yesterday, the youth and hyphen and um, some parents gathered together at the Steinhauers yesterday evening, and we had a great time of sledding. Um, it was such an awesome time. We just give them a hand, a hand of applause. It's awesome. They're, so, they're such great people. And the great thing is, I, you know, uh, I think we had eight or nine vehicles go out there, and about four of them made it up without a problem. It was great. It was such a great time, <laughs> Every, but, but uh, everybody was eventually able to make it up, and we had so much fun going down the hill, going back up the hill, snow machine rides, some great food and fellowship. It was just such a great time. Um, so I just had a few announcements uh, for our young people. Uh, many of them have, sp are, have spring break this week, um, and I, I certainly never want our young people to be bored. Um, so this coming week for our young people, we have a, a number of things going on. Uh, this, starting this coming Wednesday at 6.30 p.m., we have our, our weekly youth life group here at the church. This coming Thursday, our young people are going to meet up at 6.30 p.m., and we're going to be doing, uh, I'm, I'm calling it chopped. Uh, I'm going to give them a bunch of ingredients, and their goal is to make something and have it be tasty. So it's going to be a lot of fun. <laughs> Uh, number three, uh, on Friday, uh, this coming Friday, we have our weekly youth class. That's always a lot of fun. Uh, and then on Saturday, our youth are going to be meeting here at 2 o'clock, and we're going to be baking cake pops that we are then going to be selling on Sunday uh, for a bake sale 
Uh, number, we'll be selling the cake pops as individuals that will sell, and then we're also going to be having a silent auction bake sale where there'll be a number of really great desserts uh, made by some great professional bakers um, that we'll be selling for individuals to purchase. And everything that is raised through, these fund, through this fundraising is going to be going towards supporting our young people and going to North American Youth Congress this coming July, which is actually approaching pretty quickly, and we're very excited about that, that a number of our young people are able to go and be a part of that. Thank you, guys. Trying to figure out why he kept looking left when you're talking about those bake sales. I know it couldn't be me and nobody else is sitting up here except for maybe Brother Thibodeau. Is it Brother Thibodeau? No? Maybe? <laughs> Don't be afraid. You got to ask for what you want, you know? And Brother Thibodeau is a good baker. Amen. Amen. I am jumping way ahead for announcements, but I need to make these announcements before I release the Sunday School. Uh, there's the latest Bible study on the 20th here at the church, and of course, uh, it's always a good time uh, for the ladies who come together to share the word of the Lord with, with each other. And so please, if you are a lady and you uh, want to come to that Bible study, please do so. On the 13th, uh, Sister Roseanne likes for me to mention to you that there is a, uh, what do you call it, an event, craft sale, craft event, craft meeting, amen, it's a good time, again, for you to come and spend some time with each other, and it's not exclusively for the ladies, the men can come too, if you want to be a part of that, it is also a good time. Uh, men's retreat in Anchorage Sterling is just around the corner. It's March the 23rd through the 25th. And so if you want to go to the men's retreat in Sterling at the campground, keep that announcement in mind. You can pay at the door when you get there, or you can pay ahead, I suppose. Uh, there's a flyer out there on the, in the bulletin board that will tell you all about it. Now, I said that to get to a couple of announcements that I think are pretty important for us. On April the 9th, it's Easter Sunday. And I know you're already thinking about inviting someone to be in church with you on Easter Sunday. It is going to be a good service. It's going to be a good time uh, in the Lord. And then the next Sunday, uh, we have a special guest. Brother and Sister Hanscom will be here for that service, and he is going to share with us uh, some of the miracles that he and she experienced while they were in Pakistan. They were there for a number of years as missionaries, and God used them in a mighty way. Uh, in, that, in that particular Muslim nation, it's 98% Muslim, but God was still working it there in a very special way. So you will want to come and hear what they are doing. I had an opportunity to meet Brother Hanscom a few years ago at a minister's retreat. At that particular time, he was the director of the Multicultural Ministries. And he had, been, he had served in that, he was serving in that position. And as a matter of fact, he served in that position for 21 years. And so he has a great understanding of the multicultural ministry. There may be some insight that you can gain from that as well when you talk to him. It, it would be a good and powerful service. He is saying that miracles and signs and wonders should happen within the United States, just like it happened in Pakistan. And he believes if you come to this service, God is going to show you the mission that he has for you. And perhaps God will even grant you a miracle that you need in your life. So I would, I would encourage you for all of those that you invite for Easter Sunday, please invite them to come and be in this special service the next Sunday. And let's see what God will do. 
I believe God has a wonderful plan for his church. I believe the power that he, he shows in Pakistan is the same power he can show here at the sanctuary. God is no respect of persons. And when we walk into that area where he wants us to walk into and have the faith to believe God is going to do something wonderful for us, then he's able to bring it to pass. So I trust that you're going to be here for these special services and God is going to bless you in a mighty way. A little bit ahead of time. So keep it in mind and thank you so much for that. Uh, uh, Sunday school, you're free to go. Amen. And ushers come this way as the Sunday school is going that way. We thank the Lord for our teachers. Amen. For all of the work that they put into helping our children to grow up in the ways of the Lord. And I know I've taught Sunday school before. I had the privilege of teaching teenagers. So that was a little bit different than the toddlers, if you will. But it was a good experience. And I gained some insight into how uh, teenagers think, but I've probably lost that insight by now. You know, I, I, I don't know. So, But anyway, I think it's a wonderful thing that uh, the teachers are willing to uh, share with our children things they've learned of the Lord. Brother Ecca, please pray. Amen. Ministry is very important for each and every one of us. And I trust that you have been thinking about your ministry, what you want the Lord to do with you and through you. I'm so glad he doesn't allow us to remain stagnant. He's ever reaching for us, trying to get us to draw closer to him. And when we come to a service such as this service, such as this service today, the Lord is reaching to establish us, to give us something that will encourage us and to help us to be victorious. And I trust that you have your spiritual antennas up. I trust that you believe in God to speak to you when the word goeth forth today. I trust that as you stand, as we sing this next song, that God is just going to strengthen you. He's going to give you something that is going to bless you in a very powerful, powerful way. Thank you for being in this service. Thank you for taking the time to believe that God is going to talk to you. I need a miracle in my life. My wife need a miracle in her life. And if you're here today, I believe you, had a, you need a miracle too. Amen. Don't ever be satisfied with where you are, but ever reach for more of the Lord. Because the closer you draw to him, the closer he's going to come to you. He says, draw nigh unto me, and I will draw nigh unto you. So as we're going to sing this next song, as you're lifting your hands in faith, as your mind is being saturated by the spirit of God, Believe that God is going to minister to you for the special need that you have. Brother A.G., one more verse is, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. We're here in the presence of the Lord. We are dwelling in a secret place of the Most High. That means his might is here in this house. And that need that you spoke of, he has the answer. We're in the presence of the Lord, and the Bible says where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. He's ready to free us from that situation we're in. Free us, hallelujah, from the need that is pressing against us, because we're in the presence of the Lord.
I'm thankful to the one who spoke everything into existence like we heard earlier today is still the same one who's speaking today. He's still the same one that in this service can speak peace into somebody's life. He can speak healing into somebody's body. I'm thankful that we serve a God who loves us so much. Even when we don't deserve it, that God would come and meet us in a place like this. And if, if you will, let's just lift up our hands one more time and tell him that we love him in this place. Lord, we welcome you in this place today, Jesus. And God, we worship your name, Lord. God, we pray that you would just be with us in this place today. God, open up every heart in every mind in this place today, Jesus. Lord, we love you, Jesus. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. You can be seated today. Amen. I, I'm pretty excited about the cook-off. What would you call it? Chopped? That's pretty exciting. I remember when I was in Boy Scouts, they, they did a competition like that with us, and they gave us a box full of random ingredients and we had to cook something out of it and we decided to try and make bread and we added ramen chicken flavoring to it and we made chicken bread and it was probably one of the weirdest things I've ever tasted but you know what it was pretty good and I'm going to be pretty excited to see what kind of sort of stuff the youth come up with during that and if you guys are, are, are going to be here next Sunday I, I would encourage you to support the youth and what they're doing if you haven't been to NAYC and you want to make an impact in a young person's life, support a young person going to NAYC because I can tell you that it will change their life. And I, I still remember what, what it was like to step in. I, I went in 2013. I still remember what it was like being in that place and just at the time, it was much larger now, but at the time it was 22,000 young people all worshiping God at the same time. If you want to talk about knowing what it's going to be like in heaven with everybody worshiping, that is such an awesome experience to be able to send a young person to. Amen. It just feels like there, there's a sense of joy here today. And, and I, I don't know if that's because you're just excited to be in church or if some of you are like me, the clock in your car is once again correct. I don't know if you're like me, but I, sometimes I just let, it, it changes from year to year, and now my wife, I think, makes me change it, but it used to just be half the year the clock in my car was wrong, and just kind of waited for it to come back around again, and it'll, it'll be right at some point. It'll be right at some point. But praise God, I, I, I want to share something with you today that God has put on my heart, and it's been weighing on me ever since ministers retreat, and God, God really touched me this year, and God put something on my heart, and I just have not been able to get it out of my mind, and, and it's the phrase, the right place at the wrong time. Right place, wrong time. And so today, I just want to take a few moments and just preach on that, the right place, wrong time. And I, I remember flying home from vacation one year, and and I was flying out of Seattle, and if, if you're like me, I, I don't enjoy flying through Seattle Airport. I feel like every time I go there, it's always under construction. It, nothing is ever complete. I went through Seattle this last year, and I was pleasantly surprised to see that they were still working on the same bathroom they were a year and a half earlier. It was still closed for construction. And this time when I went through, I, I got to my gate, and I don't know if I was looking at at my times differently, or if I got things a little mixed up, but I arrived at my at my gate around 7.50 p.m., and when I got to the gate, I saw a sight that you never want to see when you're trying to get on a plane, and that's the plane pulling away from the jetway, and I realized that I had misinterpreted the time that I was supposed to be there. I was at the right gate, but it was not the right time, and once that plane starts moving no matter how much you beg them they're not going to pull it back up to the gate and she just told me sorry you'll have to catch the next one and I that was a discouraging thing for me and maybe you've had situations like that in your own life I know I've been hunting and, and I'm not the best hunter but I've enjoyed going hunting and and you know I've gone places uh you know gone caribou hunting and I can see all the other remains of where other people clean their caribou but there's none as far as the eye can see when I go there and so I just get that feeling, you know, well, I'm obviously in the right place, just at the wrong time. And so today I want to talk about that. And even what I said earlier, it doesn't have to do much with daylight savings time, but it's a phrase that we've all heard, right place, wrong time. And I'm sure some of us have even said it ourselves 
if we're being honest. And it's almost like a put down when you think of it, kind of. It's like, well, you, you kind of got half credit. You know, you were at the right place, but it was at the wrong time. You know, you, you almost did good. You kind of almost made it there. But still, there's kind of that, almost that, that slight put down, you know, like, you almost made it, but you were still wrong. It didn't work out correctly. You were the right place, but just not the wrong time. You were where you should have been, but the timing isn't lining up with the way it should be. And there's that disconnect there when we talk about it. Generally, we don't talk about that in a positive manner, but there's generally a, a disconnect there. All, all throughout history, I mean, some of the funnest stories that I enjoy reading in history are things about things being a little bit too early or, or too late. You know, things just not adding up, people being at the right place at the wrong time and, uh, or, and just missing out on something or unintentionally starting off some huge historical thing. And I'm not going to get into too many of those, but today I want to talk about how that can affect us in the spiritual. Amen. If we can feel sometimes like life isn't making sense or it's not working out right. And if we aren't careful, we can turn to God and ask the question, God, why am I here? And it becomes easy to begin to doubt God when we don't see the whole picture. All we see is the circumstances surrounding us. And we look at God and we begin to wonder, Lord, was this really your will? Or did you get the timing wrong? Lord, did you mess up right here? Because nothing seems to be making sense. And all I see are problems and difficulties around me. And I feel frustration and anxiety. And I feel like I'm where you told me to be, God. But the picture in front of me isn't matching up to what I think it should be. So maybe, Lord, maybe you got the timing wrong. And maybe this just isn't going to work out. And, and too often we, we're so engrossed with just what is around us. And how many of you have ever flown out of Anchorage and you've looked at the ocean out of your plane window because you're bored? I don't know. I like looking out of the windows of planes. Maybe if you're scared of heights, that's not the funnest thing for you to do. But when you look down at the water, it just looks so calm and serene. But you know that if you were to be down there on a lifeboat, it would be a different story. And, and those giant waves that are throwing boats around and, and splashing and crashing around from a plane, they just like little... They're just little divots in, in the big scheme of things. And if we're not careful, sometimes that hurt in our heart, we look at those giant waves around us and we say, God, don't you see what I'm going through? Don't, don't you see the things around me? And we begin to wonder, Lord, am I, am I in the right place at the wrong time, Lord? And I feel like God is trying to reach some hurting people here today who maybe you feel like that you're doing what God is calling you to do, but maybe you're just at the right place at the wrong time. And maybe the timing's just not right because things aren't working out the way they should be. And so that's caused some doubt to creep into your heart of, did I really hear God speak to me? If I'm going through what I'm going through, did God really speak to me or, or is there a disconnect between me and him? And in Matthew 14, 22 through 24, we, we see a story uh, and it says, immediately Jesus made his disciples, he made them, told them this is what you're going to do. He commands them, go into the boat and go before him to the other side. And while he sent the multitudes away, so he, he tells his disciples to get into the boat, go out into the middle of the water and he sends the multitudes away. And when he sent the multitudes away, he went up to the mountain by himself to pray. And now when the evening came, he was alone up there. So there's been some time that has passed. God has, Jesus has commanded them to go out into the water and then he makes his way up to the mountain. And, and then it says after that, he says, but the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves for the wind was contrary. That's a nice way of saying it's not fun to be in the boat. That's a polite way of saying it's not a good day to be sailing. But it doesn't say that it got stormy until after they went out there. So I imagine when they got into the boat and they went out there, everything seemed fine. And, and in their minds, God, God is telling us to go somewhere, so we're going to go there. Jesus commanded us to get in the boat and go in the middle of the lake, so that's what we're going to do. And and until evening comes, everything is fine and everything seems good and normal until the storm begins. They were confident until things started getting rough and things weren't like they were at the beginning. So I wonder now, what are they beginning to think in their minds? 
In the midst of this storm, are, are they looking around saying, where is Jesus? Where is he? He told us to come here and now we're here and he's left us to the storm and we're all alone. And, and where is he at? He's up on the mountaintop. And in the minds of the disciples, there's a disconnect. There, there's a war between flesh and faith, between the carnal and the spiritual, where faith confidently says, God told me to go here and so I'm going to go. And the flesh cries out, where is he? I'm in a storm. Doesn't he know what I'm going through? Doesn't he see the danger that we're in? Why is he so distant in this time of need? And when we go through difficult times, if we aren't careful, we can slip into that doubting mindset of doubting God's plan and timing. You see, they were, they were there, but they were looking for where Jesus was. Because they, they, they thought that they were in the right place, but maybe this, this is the wrong time. Maybe Jesus got the timing wrong because maybe we've been out here too long, or maybe he picked the wrong day because now we're in danger. And at the moment that they're needing him, Jesus is praying on the mountain. And they in their hearts know that they need him there. But he wasn't so far from them. When we go through trials in our life, it can seem like, and maybe I'm alone in this, but I've gone through things in my life. And sometimes it feels like I'm in the middle of the storm and Jesus is on the mountain. And he's so far removed from my pain and my struggle and my anxiety that surely he doesn't see what's happening to me. And this is the story of the disciples. They're in the middle of what could be a life-threatening situation. And in their hearts they cry out, where is he? Where is the one who can speak peace to this storm? Why has he left us here? And if we're not careful, our own hearts can enter into that dangerous place where we begin to wonder, did I really hear from God? Did he really tell me to do this? Or, or, or is he mistaken or am I mistaken? Someone messed up here. Surely this can't be the will of God. And, and we feel like maybe he's got that timing wrong. And in our hearts we say, Lord, I did as you commanded, but this doesn't make sense. Because I feel like I'm maybe at the right place, but the wrong time. And the disciples sit there and feel like Jesus is, he may only be 10 miles away, but as far as they're concerned, he's a million miles away. In the middle of the storm, they, they feel that anxiety and that pain. And, they, and they're, I'm sure the faith inside of them said, he's going to come through. But the flesh said, where is he? Where is he? What, what has he done? Has he made a mistake today or what is going on today? Maybe I heard wrong or maybe God has made a mistake. And in John chapter 11, we, we see another story. And this is kind of a longer story, but I really want to go through it because it kind of really brings it together and really makes sense of this situation that we can go through. And in John 11, chapter, chapter 11, verse 17, it says, So when Jesus came... And this is the story of Lazarus. Many of us know this story, but it says when Jesus came, he found that he, Lazarus, had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away. And many of the Jews had joined the women around Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. So a bunch of women come from Jerusalem to comfort Mary and Martha who are, are together right now. They're, they're close to each other. And we've heard the story of Martha and Mary. You know, Martha was the diligent worker. And Martha was the one who, who was so consumed with the tasks and getting things done that she didn't go sit at the feet of Jesus. Whereas Mary was all consumed with being at his feet and being as close to the master as she could be. And here we, we see something different that happens. There, there's something that has changed in the situation because it says, then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary stayed sitting in the house. Now Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Even in her doubt, 
She says, if you had been here, if you had been at the right place at the right time, he would still be alive. But she continues it and says, but even now, I know. If you ask it, it'll be done. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. So she says, I, I believe you, Jesus. I believe that's going to happen someday. That's going to be, it, I believe it, Lord. I, I can believe that someday it's going to happen. He's going to be part of that resurrection in the last day. And Jesus said to her and corrects her here almost and says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this, Martha? And she said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God who has come into the world. And when she had said these things, she went her way and secretly called to Mary, her sister, saying, the teacher has come and is calling for you. Now, when they heard that Jesus was coming, scripture says that Mary and Martha were together. So they both knew he was coming, but only Martha went to go meet him. And so after meeting him, Martha comes back and she tells Mary that the teacher is calling for you. And as soon as she heard that, she rose quickly and came to him. And now Jesus had not yet come into the town, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. And then the Jews who were there with in the house comforting her, when they saw that Mary rose up quickly and went out, they followed her saying, she is going to the tomb to weep there. In verse 32, then when Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet saying to him, Lord, if you had been there, my brother would not have died. If you had been there, Jesus... He would not have died. Lord, you've come to the right place, but you've got the timing wrong. You're too late. And this time, Mary, the one who before sat at the feet of Jesus, eager to hear everything he had to say, doesn't follow it up with, Lord, I believe that you still can. She leaves it just that, Lord, if you had been here, he would not have died. If you had been here, she equated his presence with, with that promise that if he was just there, at the right time, it would have happened, but now it's too late. Now, if you had been here, it would be different, Jesus. And in our own hearts, we can enter into that same thing of, Lord, if you had been here, my life wouldn't have been like this. Lord, if you had been here, I wouldn't have made this mistake. Lord, if you had been here at the right time, my family wouldn't have fallen apart. Lord, if you'd been here at the right time, this addiction wouldn't have overtaken me. Lord, if you'd been here at the right time, I wouldn't be where I am. And so Martha says, if you had been here, Lord, but even now I know. But Mary has a, has a different attitude in her heart. Mary has a doubt in her flesh, and her flesh comes to the fore here and, and almost demands of Jesus, why were you not here? Who do you think you are? You're too late. You've got the timing all wrong. You should have been here four days ago. You're at the right place, Jesus, but sorry, it's the wrong time. You've made a mistake. And her attitude is in that state, and she remains there up into this point. And it's almost like she's saying, Jesus, you've messed up. Jesus, you don't understand what I've gone through the last four days. You don't understand the pain and the anxiety. And so often we... We can get frustrated and that flesh can rise up in us and we, we ask the same question of, Lord, if you had been here, Lord, I wouldn't be going through this right now, Lord. It's, maybe I'm in the right place, but it's the wrong time. And may, maybe some of you have come into this place today and, and you've been having a hurt weighing on your heart and, and you felt like, I'm in the right place. I'm in the house of God. I'm, I'm doing what God has called me to do, but maybe it's been at the wrong time. And maybe I got the timing wrong, or maybe God chose the wrong person, and maybe God got the timing wrong in my life. And, and so you've come to church, and you know you're in the right place, but there's still a heaviness that is weighing on your heart and has gripped you with anxiety and depression and is crushing you in that, saying, Lord, was this the right place at the wrong time? Lord, did you make a mistake in my life? 
She says, Lord, you are where you should be, but you're too late. You could have saved him, but you're too late. She didn't see the potential for a miracle in front of her. All she could see was the hurt around her. And when we go through difficult situations, when we go through storms like the disciples went, or when we deal with loss, it's important that we keep our mind on Jesus. Because if we start looking at the waves around us and we start looking at the pain and the hurt in our own heart, it's going gonna, it's gonna to cause bitterness to seep in there. And it's going to cause a, a divide between you and Jesus because that flesh is going to want to rise up and demand an answer. And doesn't want to wait till the end to see what could be. And so how many of us have felt that same way? Don't raise your hands, but in your own heart, examine ourselves. Say, how many of us have felt the same way of, of asking God, Lord, did you make a mistake? Because God, this doesn't add up to me. Lord, this doesn't make sense to me. Lord, I've drifted too far. Lord, I, it's like I'm in the right place, but I'm just too late the right place at the wrong time, Lord. And maybe you've come in here today and you feel like you've missed that moment, that God called you to something and and maybe you didn't answer it when you felt like you should have. So now you feel like you're just drifting away from the will of God. But I've come here to tell you today that God is not done with you yet. God has not forgotten you. God does not get his timing wrong. God does not make mistakes. He is not confused. But if God called you then, then he is calling you now. And then in verse 33, it says, Therefore, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her weeping, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. And he said, Where have you laid him? Where have you put the body? Where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. And Jesus wept. And then the Jews said, see how he loved him. Past tense. See how he loved him. And some of them said, could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind also have kept this man from dying? Maybe Jesus just, this man who can do all things and can heal, maybe he just doesn't understand like we understand. And sometimes we can do that too, where, Lord, maybe you don't understand it like I do. You don't don't see the picture like I do, but I promise you that God does. And in verse 38, then Jesus again groaning in himself, groaning in himself. There's turmoil in Jesus' heart over this. That's the second time scripture records that in this short little section. He came to the tomb and it was a cave with a stone laid against it. And Jesus said, take away the stone. And Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time there is a stench. He's been dead for four days. Take away the stone. And she says, Lord, but the stench is too much. Don't do it, Lord. There's nothing pretty on the other side of that. Lord, there's nothing good that's going to come of this. And Jesus tells him to roll away the stone at the door. And what that tells me is that you can come here today feeling like the call of God has left and that your relationship with God is dead and buried, that that dream is dead in your life, but, and it's not too late. But praise God, he can still roll away the stone. You may have come today and in your heart you feel like you've buried that dream, you've buried that calling, but God is telling someone today, I'm going to roll away the stone that you've covered up your heart with. I'm, I'm going to move away the things inside your heart that you've used to separate me from you. And I'm going to breathe life into that which was dead and gone. And you thought it was far too gone for you. You thought four days he's been dead. And maybe today you've been going through a time and you feel like, God, it's been too long since I've prayed. God has been too long since I've come to an altar. And God is saying, if you'll just come and meet me, I'm going to roll away the stone that's in front of your heart that thing that you buried I'm going to breathe life into that tells me that God is able to bring to life the things in our own hearts and it doesn't matter what kind of walls we put up in our heart but God is able to bring life back into it 
Doesn't matter how long it's been. Doesn't matter how long you've been struggling. If you feel like God's timing was off, I can promise you his timing is never off. God did not arrive at that tomb four days late, and he's not arriving in your life today late. But God has a purpose and a plan for us today. Amen. If you believe that, why don't you give him a hand clap of praise? Amen. You may have rolled a stone in front of your heart today. You may have covered your heart, but God is not finished with you yet. So don't let the enemy tell you that the timing is off. If Lazarus had not died, then they would never have seen Jesus yell into an empty tomb to a man who's been dead four days and say, Lazarus, come forth. If it had not been for that, they would have never seen the miracle. And so today God is encouraging someone in this building that you've been struggling with something in your life. And you've been going and wrestling with it. And God is telling you today that if you had never wrestled with it, you would never have seen the miracle that is coming. And then if you want to see the miracle, there's going to have to be a crisis first. And if they had not had this situation, if Jesus had not come at this time, they might not have had the miracle that they did. Sure, Jesus could have healed him, but they never would have heard Jesus say to a dead man, come forth, and he gets out of his grave. And so today, if you've been putting up walls in your heart and you feel like you've covered it and you've buried those things in your life, that, that dream that God gave to you, I would encourage you today that God does not want you to stay there, but God is wanting to breathe life into you today. God is wanting to roll away that stone that you have so ardently and probably difficultly put over your heart to protect it and to bury those things that are in the past and bury those things that you gave up hope on. Just like Martha and Mary gave up any hope that their brother could come back. Some of us have hidden the call of God and hidden the dream that he's put in our life and we've buried it and we've forgotten about it. But God doesn't stop at a tomb. God doesn't stop at a stone in front of a tomb, but God wants to restore some people here today. And if you feel like you're stuck today and you feel like maybe you've been at the right place at the wrong time, I want to tell you that God's timing is never off. His timing is perfect. His will is perfect. And he loves you. When Jesus went out to the disciples on the boat and they saw him, they were at first afraid. And he said, it is I, do not be afraid. First thing, first thing he says, it's me. You know who I am. I've been with you. You know me, Jesus, healer, savior, miracle worker. You know who I am, so don't be afraid. And if you're here in this building today and you feel like you've been going through a situation that you just don't see any way out and you don't see how things can end up well, I want you to know that Jesus is walking in this place to saying, it is me. Don't be afraid. Don't worry about what's coming. Don't worry about the waves that are around you. Don't worry about the situations that seem overwhelming. Don't worry about that thing that seems irreversible because it is me. Don't be afraid. I can do all things. In Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. If God has brought you to the right place, it will be at the right time. Just because we may not see the whole picture, we may not see how it ends up, that doesn't mean that God's timing is wrong or that it's off. It just means that we haven't seen the big picture because I've gone through times where I doubted and I felt like maybe things had messed up and maybe God had given up on me. But now when I look back on that, I can see God moving through all those situations and I can see God just planning my life and moving in the direction that he wanted to go. But at the time, it didn't make any sense. And at the time, it was pain. And at the time, it was confusion. But now I can look back and I can give glory to God for the things that he's done in my life. And if you just make up in your mind that no matter what this world throws against me, I'm going to put my hand in his hand. You're going to be able to look back and see all the times that Jesus came through for you. Amen. It took a tomb to see a resurrection. 
If those disciples had never been out of the storm, they never would have seen Jesus walk on water. And Peter would never have had the testimony to say that I also walked on water with him for a short while. For those testimonies to be birthed, there had to be something that came first. So don't don't feel like just because you're in the right place and it feels like the wrong time that God has forgotten about you. That God has has left you aside or that God is going to let that thing that's been dead inside of you stay dead. Because God wants to bring resurrection and God wants to restore some things today. And he does not make mistakes. Don't trust in the things of this world. Don't, don't pay heed to the wind and the waves because they're going to be gone tomorrow. They shift and they change. Don't, don't pay attention to the reports of this world, but just choose to, when things get rough and things get confusing to just put your hand in his hand and say, Lord, I'm going to trust you. God, I don't see the whole picture. God, it doesn't make sense, but Jesus, I'm going to trust that you are who you say you are. Amen. Amen. Please stand today with me. Mary's heart got the better of her. If you're here today and maybe your relationship isn't where you want it to be with God, then today you can make it right. Maybe you've come to this place today and you feel like something should have changed by now. Something should have happened. Something's just not right. And maybe you've, in response to that, in response to that pain and that confusion, you've put up walls around your heart in order to protect you. And without meaning to, you've blocked out the one who who can help you. Because when we get hurt, we put up those walls. And and Jesus is a gentleman. He's not going to break down the walls of your heart. And he's not going to force you to to lean on him and to trust in him. But if you will, then God's going to take down those walls. He's going to roll away the stone that you've put in front of your heart and that pain that you've been dealing with, that unanswered question that you've been dealing with. He's going to breathe life into it. Mary had given up on her brother and they'd sealed that door and and given over to mourning. But God has a message of restoration today. A restoration of the promise that God has given you. and I just feel like throughout the message, I've, I've just felt like that there's specifically someone here today. And if this is for you today, then grab a hold of what God is putting for you. Because there's someone here today that God gave you a promise. And for them, it was four days. But maybe for you, it's been more time. And you feel like that, that thing that God gave you, whether it was a calling or a dream or a promise, you feel like it's been dead and gone and you've given up hope on it and so you've buried it and put it in the past. And God is here for that person today, wherever you are under the sound of my voice. God is telling you, why don't you come to an altar and let me roll away the stone that you've covered it with. Let me roll away that stone and do a miracle in your life. And so if you need him today, if there's something in your life, I would encourage you to come to this altar and seek him today while he can be found. Lord, just reveal every doubt and every fear in us. Lay it down to this altar today. These altars are open. If you know somebody who's been going through something, then grab them by the arm and say, brother, sister, let me pray with you. We're going to get through this and we're going to trust in God's timing that he's going to see you through this. And he's not going to leave you by yourself today, but God is going to be with us in this place today. Oh, God has someone here in this place who needs him. If you need him today, if, if you're dealing with that pain and struggling with that, then come to this altar today. These altars are open. Lord, we need you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, I pray that you would just touch us today, God. Lord, I know that your timing is always right, God. So touch that one today who's been hurting, God. Touch that one today who has been burying that pain and has put up walls around their heart, God, and has put a stone in front of their heart so they don't have to see that pain anymore, God. Lord, I pray that you would just minister to them in a mighty way, Jesus. Lord, do what only you can do, Jesus. God, I need you today, Lord. God, I need you today, Jesus. Lord, I need you today. Open up every heart and every mind in this place. I'm in despair.
desperate need of mercy at the end of my own strength.